I, the, I think one of the key questions was when would is it most appropriate to use a map, use the maps process, and when is it most appropriate to use path, a path, and what's the kind of key advantages to each? That's a small question for us, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> if we start with path, now path is fully forward looking, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't really spend any time on the past. It does talk about the now, um, but it's so it's really good for kind of any forward looking kind of planning situation you're in. So especially where you want it to be very positive, very forward looking. So points of transition, um, if, if it's again, what's good, what we're looking at here in terms of the future. Um, we're just wanting to kind of, yeah, just have a kind of speculative, positive planning session about the future with a child, with their family, with a team, with the school team. You know, it could be as, as broad as you like. But the key thing to remember, it's very forward looking. And of course, it has that section with what's what are we trying to achieve in the next year? And that's quite important. That's which isn't in the map process. So if you're wanting to kind of dream for the future and set goals for the future, uh, everybody wants to be forward looking and oftentimes people don't really want to think much about what's gone before for good reason because it's, it's just too murky um, too difficult that's your that's your path i would say um so and it is the gold standard i think the path and with the elements in it it was the last one that uh, jack pierpoint uh, john john o'brien and marsh forest devised it was the last the the most recent creation so I think and they kind of learned from what went before, which I think also has affected it. Now, in terms of the map process, I find I think the map um, is, is kind of more therapeutic with a small T. So mm -hmm. any situation you're in that is still involved needs some planning, um, but there the kind of is a need to talk about the past. We've got to talk about it. We can't move into the future without talking about the past. And we know there's plenty of situations like that. Um, or it could be we almost want to celebrate the story. You know, there's quite a lot of ups in the story. And we want to come. Kind of, we really want to celebrate those um, as much as talk about the difficult times before we can talk about the future. So there I think that's pretty crucial. So we did some work with two primary schools that have been impacted on by the Grenfell Tower, you know, awful tragedy. So the map was perfect because we worked with the staff teams and we literally needed to hear that story needed telling it needed holding and it did processing really so to, to have that knowing that story was going to be said was really kind of useful before they could go anywhere near thinking about the future and um and same with some families you know they're, they're so stuck at a point maybe there's been a brain injury kind of a big thing happened way back and it kind of the narrative needs telling if you like up to that point what happened then but then kind of carrying on through and, if, and i think often when there's been trauma involved again i'll probably reach for the for the map process because it has got this this it's got a very strong link in with the narrative because of the story uh, and it's 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 there and the fact we can we're kind of retelling the story and we can kind of think for the future so um so sort of post-traumatic work definitely 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 good stuff um it doesn't have the goal setting piece in it though um, but having said that, it does have the nightmare in it. And again, there's times when situations around individual children and their families, people want to talk about the nightmare, don't they? Mm -hmm. um, or, or maybe it's not being talked about more importantly. It's like an elephant in the room. It's haunting everybody. Dad's about to come out of prison or we think this child's about to drop into special education or we're permanently excluded or an older young person's going to end up in prison. You know, everybody's worrying about these things. Nobody's really saying it out loud. So the beauty with the map is you can say, well, let's see your worst nightmares. And, uh, and as you reach the end of that section, you can say, but I bet there's something else, isn't there? What you're really worried about here, is there an elephant in the room? This is something that's not being named. And then you can kind of flush it out, really. So certainly more therapeutic and um, the map process, but the path for kind of for thinking ahead. That's what I'd say in a nutshell. We did a map as part of the 16 to 25 group after we'd done several years work. Mm -hmm. We took stock with a map and then oh. did did a forward plan. It was so helpful, yes. but I hadn't realised the difference between the two until you articulated it, Colin. So it that's really marked. helpful. Yes, yeah, thanks, Guy. It is quite marked. I mean, um, I had worked with you know, these kind of settings that are meant to be quick turnaround. 
Um, so like a, you know, alternative provisions, stroke mm -hmm. PRU kind of style setup. I certainly I worked with one setup down there, down in Suffolk, and the idea was be there would be a, a map as the young person joined that setting, and then a path as they left at yeah. the receiving school. And I thought that was a nice little combination. It could be used in other situations. You know, a map where we need to know the story, but then as we kind of moving forward, or in, as we're kind of moving to more inclusion, full on path. Because I would think probably the map is best for transition moments. I'm working mm -hmm. with a young person right now. He's, it's been pretty up and down. He's moving to a different secondary school. And it's the map. I'm definitely going for the map because I want them to hear the story. And if you hear the story of a young person, especially the struggles and the battles the family have had, there's more, it's more likely they're going to kind of own that young person. I feel like they kind of want them to be part of part of their new the new community. So good for transition, definitely. Do you find if you have used a map that because they're they're talking about kind of the history and and the trauma that there needs to be? How do you manage kind of the I guess the physiological effects of that and the emotions at that time? Mm -hmm. Good question. Good question, Karen. Good question. Um, and I'm working with a, another psychologist um, from Cambridge here on this whole theme, really. We wonder we might come up with something that's going to be called aftermath or something along those lines, really. And you can kind of think, well, we, you can almost guess where we're going with this, really. Um, and he's done a lot of work with kind of CBT and uh, is it e -R -E -R DM? I'm never quite sure that's national. Mm -hmm. is it? Yeah, you know, you know the one I mean anyway. Yeah. Uh, and he's done work with groups kind of using these processes. And he's got this idea that we could be we could go through the story. And as it's retold back to the young person or whoever's been on the receiving end of the trauma, they might be doing something, you know, something like this or some other kind of mm -hmm. uh, one of these sort of process techniques, things to mm -hmm. kind of help with that sensory thing you're talking about there. Um, so using the good stuff we know about those ways of working and bringing them together with person centered planning, I think there's some mileage in it, don't you? Definitely think some mileage in it. Um, but at the moment, if I were just to do it now, I would just I would concentrate on really good listening and that notion of holding the group um, or the individual, you know, um, not trying to do anything with it, not trying to process it, never probing, never trying to go anywhere else with it. The usual stuff we might do as psychologists, literally just letting the story be told and literally be held. So nobody's phased by it, nobody's running out of the room crying. We're just we're just sitting with it, holding it, and we're recording it. We're doing no more than that, really. Um, and then the and thinking of this aftermath process, we were thinking maybe when we got to the um, kind of staying strong aspects, we might ha even have the notion of a shield there. You know, what, what would it take to shield us from future trauma and kind of bringing in some other kind of metaphors like that? That could be helpful or whether the value bricks that get, get kind of built around the nightmare. And um, again, they could have some sort of shield aspects, some other kind of building strength aspect to hold other traumas away, really. And that the nightmare could be, of course, the trauma reoccurs or we revisit it or we have some really bad experience. So I think it's got it's definitely got promise in the whole world of trauma. And I know when we used it in, the, in those those schools post Grenfell, it was it was yeah better than anything else we could have reached for really for a collective process. So that's quite challenging, isn't it, with a group of people? Absolutely, and each with their own version of, of events. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Thank you.